Grief is a thin place, a place so thin, it's hard to tell where earth ends and heaven begins. Grief is a place so thin that it's where the living and the dead feel one another's love. I'm Lisa Hamilton, an Episcopal priest, and I grieve. First, I'll read some scripture that many Christians use in worship during Lent, and then I'll struggle with those words through the lens of grief. I'm glad you've joined me. Today's scripture is from Jeremiah chapter 31. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Sometimes I write letters to my son, Ted, who left this life at age 27. And this is what I wrote not long ago. Dear Ted, the other day in the airport, I noticed the little birds who get trapped indoors. They fly up to the atrium toward the light, but of course there's no way out. And that's how I feel, Teddy. I'm trapped by this earthly existence, like those birds who exist on cookie crumbs dropped by messy travelers. In my dreams, I peck at the glass where there is light. Is that how it is when you enter life with drugs? A trap in which you swore toward light but are always pulled back to the earth by the need to eat the pills that make living tolerable? I believe you're in heaven now, Ted, with all your iniquities forgiven, but I still have lots of questions. When did you arrive in heaven? When your brain died or when your body was given away piece by piece, part by part, as you were an organ donor? Do you ever come back to the earth, pulled by your need to love? Did your dad meet you? I hope so. Like him, could you only be well in death? Do you forgive me for all my mistakes in raising you? When we lay in that bed that week in the hospital, when your heart beat, although your brain was dead, did you know I forgave both of us, for both of us? But only now I remember my sins a lot better than I remember forgiveness. I came across something on Facebook the other day that said, our purpose in this life is to walk one another home. And I hope you and your dad feel that I walked you home. I didn't want to walk either of you home. I wanted to walk both of you back to life. Dad from the terror and decay of his cancer back to our sunlit backyard where he played with you in your turtle-shaped sandbox. And you, from the nowhere land of the hospital, back to your plans to become a therapist. Because like you told me a few months earlier, the only way to really be happy is to take care of other people. I can't make myself believe in happiness anymore, Ted. But I think I believe in redemption more than ever before. And it's coming from the kindness of others. Do you know how much love I've received since you died? It doesn't replace you, but somehow it redeems the suffering of those I've loved and lost, especially you and your dad. I've changed since your dad died 25 years before you did. You know there are always betrayals when you lose someone. People let you down, and sometimes it's just that they could really be present for you until they can't. And then when they can't, it's such a shock, and it really hurts. Well, when this happened after your dad died, it just gutted me. It just shut me down. I found it extremely hard to receive help, let alone ask for it. But now I find endurance and accepting kindness from others. 
Maybe this is a gift from you, Ted, or the kindest person I've ever known. And I think this is what I mean by redemption. Somehow your suffering is redeemed in the kindness of others that I receive. The wordless hug, the understanding listening, the reaching out to me. It's just like the first rule of the creative writing courses at which you excelled. People are at our best when we show instead of tell. I experience a lot more showing when I'm open to it, Ted. No surprise, huh? Well, this was a nice surprise. As I was writing to you, your friend Daniel texted me to say he'd just come from Good Friday Mass and a drive through the woods, feeling your strong presence. And Drew texted just yesterday to ask how I'm doing. Do you like it that I send your friends your favorite cookies for your birthday? It's a good thing you were born during Girl Scout cookie season. It would be hard to get Samoas otherwise. And you know where that idea came from? From my high school friend Barb, who wanted to be sure your favorite cookie was served at the reception after your funeral. She even labeled the tray, Girl Scout Samoas, Ted's favorite cookie. I don't think you ever met Barb, but if you had, you wouldn't be surprised that she labeled. <laughs> She's always been like that. So many kindnesses just coming from who people are. Oh, Ted, I did my best to walk you and Dad home. And now, well, do you remember the story of the road to Emmaus when people realize Jesus is walking with them after his resurrection? Now I feel others walking with me. I'm lonely for you, but I'm not alone. So that's from a letter I wrote to Ted. But here's how I said it for a sermon. I've heard it said that our job in this life is to walk each other home. I went home to bury the ashes of my first husband, Scott, and then 25 years later, the ashes of our son, Ted, next to his. I learned something extraordinary in that time. It's simple, but it took me two devastating deaths in a quarter of a century. I learned that it is the kindness of others that keeps me breathing. And here's what I want to say to you. Grief is a thin place.